This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, welcome again to the podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. Uh, look, Tesla numbers are in. We're going to get into that. We got lots of viewer questions to get into, as well, some other stuff. But before we do that, I want to wish everybody. Uh, by the time most of you will be hearing this, a uh, happy 4th of July, Independence Day in the U.S., because, uh, hey, it's a big party, and it's an excuse to blow stuff up, right? <laughs> Here in Canada, we oh, had ours on July 1st, and I was just telling Eric before, you know, because he asked me how was Canada Day, and I said, well, it's pretty good, but it's about the only time you'll see Canadians actually get uh, patriotic about anything, and I think we can give you a pretty good run for money on one day of the year. <laughs> Otherwise, not so much, but uh, no, it was it's a good time. So, yes, I want to wish everybody a happy Independence Day, uh, because by the time you hear this, it will be July 4th uh, tomorrow. So, as usual, I have uh, Eric Camacho and Ian Pavelko. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Hello, everybody. I'm doing well. My voice is slightly deeper than usual, just getting over a little cold here, so... Well, it's better than it was last week. I find it interesting to use the word, I'm, feel, I'm doing well, when the, the, the thing you are is not well. No, this is well compared to a few days ago when I was coughing up a lung, <laughs> part of the liver, and whatever all else was coming up. No, I'll take this. Believe me, hey, as you know well. What? It's an odd way of having weight loss. Oh yeah, well, there's that. I hadn't mm-hmm. thought, always looking on the bright side, Mr. Camacho. That's a good way to do it. Like the uh, intriguing thing is, as an audience, uh, we had this conversation before the show started, and we were wondering where Ian is. Like, is he running late? He just happened to be uh, taking a cat nap. Yeah, so. I was gone. I had he one sounds like this. He sounds. He sounds like this when he wakes up. Now he's not, He sounds like this when he's sick. <laughs> so double whammy. There you go. <laughs> well, let's talk about production numbers because uh, Tesla yesterday released their uh, production numbers for the second quarter of 2019. And uh, hey, let's uh, let's give everybody at Tesla a round of applause because they certainly Woo-hoo! broke broke the records. <laughs> Woohoo! So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys some numbers and we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, so total deliveries for Q2, which is uh, 12 weeks, um, is 95,200 vehicles, of which uh, in production uh, they made 87,048 cars. Now 72,531 of those are Model Threes. Now that's an average of 6,043. Uh, models uh, model threes per week over a 12 week span um, model s and x are down a little bit they uh, produced 14,517 they delivered uh, 17,650 of those so just to put that into context I went back and looked at q1 and q2 or q4 of 2018 I should say so in q1 of 2019, uh, they delivered 63,000 vehicles, and uh, 51,000 of those were Model 3, and 12,000 of those ish uh, S and X, which of course uh, led everybody on the internet who was short position on Tesla to think there's no demand. Demand is falling off the cliff. Now, of course, sometimes they don't always read the fine lines, or in this case, what Tesla put into their their letter that uh, they had. Um, quite a bit of issues with uh, logistics, of course, and getting the cars over, of course, and they said that will shift over into Q2, which is exactly what's happened. Also, just for reference, the last time that Tesla broke some records was in Q4 of 2018. Uh, They produced, or they delivered uh, 90,700 vehicles, 62,000 of those were Model 3. So you can definitely see that there's a trend now that after that little dip of uh, Q1 that things are coming uh, back, and it's looking really good. Now, of course, this is not financial numbers at this point, so we don't know whether they're going to be profitable or not. We're kind of expecting, I think at this point, maybe a slight profit margin or maybe still a little bit in the red. We'll see what transpires. Um, We should find out that information sometime early next month. It usually takes some time for them to... uh, to compile that information so it's looking really good uh they said that they were going to um get very close i mean i i like the fact that elon was on twitter over the last few weeks and he was tempering his expectations which is which is nice to see because he tends to you know he's been saying oh we have a chance we have a chance we have a chance well it's nice to see that they actually exceeded those numbers and stuff so whether they're sustainable or not we'll we'll see um um, what are your thoughts, guys? I mean, this has been a great quarter for them. 
It's a great quarter and two things that stuck out from the letter they had in their investor relations page. The first is that there were about 7,400 vehicles in transit at the end of the quarter. Now, this is the last time they're going to have that metric announced. Uh, and that metric regards to uh, those who have either purchased a vehicle and have not taken delivery, so they haven't done the paperwork, it hasn't been transferred to the owner, um, or the they have, you know, they've already paid the full purchase price and they're just waiting for the vehicle to be uh, delivered to them. So that's a pretty significant number on its own. The other thing here is that they were saying that um, they're being slightly conservative in their delivery count uh, in due part because of those uh, customers in, or the vehicles in transit. Uh, and so th in that scenario there, they could see some variance. The number could go even higher when the final results are revealed during the, the conference call. So it, you know, this is a testament to the hard efforts of owners going this to centers and helping with deliveries. It's a testament to all the staff at Tesla and all the locations around the world trying to really get their, their legwork th uh, this past month. We know there was a major push from Tesla in the last few weeks. We talked about it uh, some time ago where they're really trying to uh, get all, as many cars in the ground as possible. And there was just a major end of the quarter push. So, you know, Model 3s were, were being levied uh, in the used market. I mean, it was just everything they could just to get these cars out there. So, Credit to everybody who works at Tesla. This is a fantastic report, and I'm looking forward to the uh, the earnings call just to see all the final numbers. Uh, but this is uh, this is again uh, the, for those that are saying that there is no demand anymore. Uh, to hell with that. This this is nothing but the opposite. This is increasing demand, uh, and it would not surprise me if we see um, in the second half of the year of 2019 just again eye popping numbers. I should hope so. There is yeah. one thing that I want to talk about. Um, which which is kind of interesting. This is the first time they've actually mentioned it. But they well, actually, they mentioned it in the uh, in the Q1 here. They say, due to the or uh, due to the order to VIN matching process we described mm -hmm. in our Q1 2019 shareholder letter, which we extended to S and X in Q2 to improve process efficiency. This metric has become less relevant. As a result, mm -hmm. we do not plan to disclose the customer vehicles in transit metric going forward. Now, this is a right. big difference because Tesla, for years, has been always saying, look, we produce this many cars, and then we deliver this many cars. And because we can't always deliver them in time for the end of the quarter, which is the time when we can realize the profits, we have to shift mm -hmm. that over to the next quarter. Mm -hmm. The way I'm reading this is because, and, and I was thinking about this today, a lot of it really has to do, if you look at, and, and they mentioned this here for SNX specifically, because one of the things that's been different about SNX compared to Model 3 is SNX always had a, a more complex um, options mix, right? You could go in, you could order whatever seat color you wanted and so on. And yeah. over the last year and a half to two years, they've been simplifying the configurations on the SNX to be more like the Model 3. Um, and once the production had really ramped up on the Model 3, we really saw this this thing of, of they're producing cars and then they're matching people to existing VINs rather than, okay, we'll give you a VIN and then we'll produce the car. So it's like mm -hmm. they're building inventory cars. So what we're seeing here is that it, this is exactly what's happened to the SNX because once they started eliminating and they're building more per, uh, bundles, uh, that they're essentially producing inventory cars. So now what's going forward now is that instead of placing an order for an SNX and then having to wait two or three months to get the car, um, they're just producing the cars in batches and they're just matching you to an existing VIN. So it seems to be um, gaining more momentum. So I think it's, it's, it's whatever they develop for this Model 3, the process and stuff seems to be working quite well for them. So now they're shifting it over to the S and the X. So I think that's what's what's going forward is that this 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 situation well people are waiting for cars when we go into the second quarter yes there's a certain amount of that but it looks like all things so i guess what i'm saying at the end of the day to make this short is that it looks like tesla has largely sorted out the worst issues as far as logistics are concerned because you know over the last few months we've been seeing a nightmarish amount of logistics problems it's, it's not like they're not they don't still exist they still have some but the fact that they've got a lot of this stuff sorted out, you know, judging by the numbers, tells me that they largely have a lot of this stuff sorted out. So well, I, th I to think your it's point, Trav, I, I was just going to say that's actually what Elon claimed he was working on on his birthday, right? Somebody on Twitter asked him that. So what are you doing for your birthday? <laughs> working mm -hmm. on logistics. Yep. I guess it shows. Yeah.
which has always been the you know one of the biggest bugaboos we've had with the company. I mean, it's a growing pain thing. I mean, you know, we've been saying this for some time. They were able to scale production, but they were not able to scale logistics in in concert with the car. It was always like, we'll deal with it later. We'll deal with it later. We got to make these cars. Now, in hindsight, they should have done it both, but it looks like you know, uh, you know, what's it been now? Another six to nine months now. They, they've got this stuff, hopefully, largely sorted out. I think going forward, if we see better sustained numbers with this, um, it should work out a little bit better. But again, I think it's a little bit premature to call it fixed. But you know, going forward, hopefully, we'll see some, uh, you know, some some better evidence of this. Um, all right. Any other uh, last thoughts before we move on to the next? I mean, these are just numbers. We can't talk about financials and stuff because, like I said, they're not out yet. But uh, um, I think it's promising at this point. I mean, it hopefully. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of talk on the internet, of course, with the with the shorts and the and the nasty, noisy, negativist trolls out there who who've been crowing about since Q1 that there's no demand for the cars. Of course, it's certainly not the case. So hopefully they'll. I mean, uh, truth be told, they've been they've been crowing about this. For years now, uh, you know the the troublesome thing about the the trolls and the and the negative comments that are on social media is, in large part, all it is is just ambient noise. You know, they're they're trying to get recognized for the inevitable thing. It's it's like the apocalypse, the end of the world sort of <laughs> announcement. Like it's the coming. In, uh, May, it's May, May 2016. Oh no, wait, we did our math wrong. It's October 2016. No, hold on, we misread it. It's going to be in uh, spring of 2000 enough like at some at some point you are have to admit you don't know what you're talking about or the audience who sees that has to just go you know what block ignore just tune it out right exactly it's Um, just the ever-shifting goalposts right they could just you know they're focused what was the latest thing i saw on the internet you know oh it wasn't demand so now they're seeing these videos of the kids playing the games in the cars now they're saying oh tesla's gonna have warranty issues because they're gonna have to replace all the tires that people are wearing out when they're playing the game like first of all you don't know what you're talking about because a warranty is not tesla's problem it's not in the other wheelhouse it's not even their responsibility so that's (laughs) it's it's, it's bs right Right. So yeah, they just make stuff up as they go. Just you know, it's just to serve their their negative narrative. It is but. it is this impish, childish thing. And what I've come to know is someone who was basically bullied as a kid. Bullies are in large part afraid. They're afraid of what it is that they don't understand or what they believe is going to overpower them. And you can either react one of two ways. You can either do what they do, which is to basically badger and browbeat people into oblivion because you think that you're always right. The other is to just take a list, a listening position and go, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I need to, you know, realize that this is actually a good thing for everything. Um, why, why it happens with Tesla more than most other companies I see in the marketplace today, I don't understand. Take that same energy and put it towards old companies, maybe to, you know, gun manufacturers. I mean, there's a hundred companies that you could do this with that are, that are more detrimental to society. Tesla's not doing anything that is harmful to the future of this planet. And yet they're the ones who are like crowing all the time. And honestly, I'm kind of sick of talking about this crap all the time about Tesla. Like, kiss my ass. I don't care. <laughs> Get out of here. Enough Amen, brother. You. You, like like, my, you like my tweet? <laughs> you, know, you know what the best thing is, too? I, I haven't been like flagged to be blocked on this group. Maybe now I will be after this whole comment tonight. But like enough i don't care you people mean absolutely nothing to my life get out of here oh my goodness sometimes with a bully all it takes is a nice hot cup of hot chocolate poured over their heads worked for me don't all right okay. from the wise. <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole story behind that i'll tell you something all, right. all right moving along we got to move on uh, some other really fantastic news. This uh, article comes from uh, our good friends at Tesla Roddy. The Model 3 has, new, has now set a new benchmark um, for the European New Car Assessment Program. That's the NCAP program. They've awarded the Model 3 a perfect five-star safety rating in every of its four categories that they test. Nice. That's adult occupant protection, child occupant, vulnerable road users, and safety assist. Um Fantastic news. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. we know this from the fact that Tesla has designed their cars from the get-go to be the safest vehicles, lowest probability of accident or um, uh, injury. Uh, injury. Injury, I should say. Yes. Um, so it just basically mirrors exactly what happened in NHTSA in the U.S., that uh, Tesla mm-hmm. designs their cars to be safe. I'm sure if there was a whiteboard, it would be the number one thing on top of the 
on top of the list. So congratulations. Uh, I mean, it's just a matter of time before they, uh, they get this award, maybe in the other markets. I don't know. Does China um, in the Asian markets test for safety as well? Or do they mirror what's going on? I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know either. Hmm. There are, I couldn't tell you what the standards are, or what they equate to. Um, they're not as severe, but they, they definitely do some form of testing. Okay. I'd have to look it up. Okay. Well, um, as usual, the links to everything we talk about on the show will be in the podcast and the uh, video description, so you guys can uh, check it out um, on your own time if you want. But uh, yeah, this is great news, and uh, I mean, it really helps. <clears throat> I think, I don't know, do we even know what the insurance rates are like in um, in Europe for these cars? I mean, they got to be about the same as us, if not. I mean, if it helps with insurance rates, uh, they look good. It'd yeah, be interesting helps. to hear from some of the um, viewers slash listeners, anybody out there in Europe, if you can uh, chime in and let us know based on your experiences with your mm -hmm. existing car that you, or whatever you're replacing it with compared to your, your Model 3 or Model S, um, chime in and, and, in the comments and let us know. That'd yeah, be, absolutely. Uh, be interesting. Yeah. yeah. It'd be great if we reached the point with insurance where EVs cost less than gas cars to insure. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we touched on it a while back when we were talking about insurance costs, maybe late last year. But I mean, uh, it cost me less to insure the Model 3 than it did my A4. And the car knew it was about double the value. And that's with replacement. I mean, that blew my mind. It was $100 a year less for a car that was twice the value mm -hmm. for, for performance well, three over standard nice. A4. Yeah where I live in Florida accidents are as commonplace as sunburns. So it'd be great if, uh, <laughs> if markets like mine could, could adjust it uh, more, more reasonably. Yeah. No kidding. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Tesla's constant fight with the dealer lobbies, because we have some good news uh, for the people in Virginia. The uh, Richmond times dispatch uh, has reported that the local judge has affirmed the DMV decision to allow Tesla to operate automotive store in Henrico County. Um, you know, Tesla has been fighting the dealer lobby situation for many, many years on a state-by-state -state basis. And um, it's great to see that they finally allowed them to rule, says the ruling is a win for consumers who are increasingly looking to purchase electric vehicles, the company said. They're talking about Tesla here. We look forward to continuing to serve our customers and grow our business across the Commonwealth. Um, yeah, this is crazy. I mean, I, I can't understand in the life of me why a, a market that's supposed to be capitalistic and for the people um, can can put up these kind of roadblocks. And I'm looking specifically at you guys in Texas and uh, Michigan. Uh, they're coming for you guys next. <laughs> uh, those two states have been uh, problematic for Tesla in, in many ways, of course. So I, I, I'm glad to see that this, um, this situation helps. I mean, it, the U.S. is literally the only country in the world, as far as I know, uh, where Tesla is not allowed to sell their cars direct. Lobby, 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 baby. Mm -hmm. Well, you have, to, you have to remember, too, the, the laws that the, that the dealers are using are just laws. They're just using them in an unjust way. Right, the laws are there to protect to protect them from existing car manufacturers for cutting in and undercutting them and selling their cars direct. So, if I'm a Ford dealer and I've invested millions of dollars in my business, the last thing I want is for Ford to come into my area, set up shop, and sell the cars direct, and then cut me out of the deal. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's perfectly valid. I don't have an issue with that. The problem is, is that these dealer lobbies are saying, well, Tesla's coming into this market and they have to play by the same rules. Well, no, they're not hurting your business because they don't, A, allow franchises in the first place. They're not going to award you a franchise. And there's not been a single piece of evidence or any business uh, for as long as Tesla's been in business uh, that's gone out of business because Tesla's selling their cars direct. So it, I'm sorry, that, that boat doesn't float as far as I'm concerned. And, and that's something that's alluded to in the ruling for this particular case. So the judge in this case, Judge Gregory L. Roop of the Richmond Circuit Court, um, he affirmed the decision. And in his um, response, in his, his publication uh, with his decision, he said, and I'm quoting, uh, he's troubled by the implications of the Tesla business model. Tesla's business model artificially creates a situation where it seems no independent dealer could be profitable. Accepting such a business model lets the tail wag the dog. And that, again, is a very disingenuous look at what Tesla's doing. Um, you know, I, I understand the example you give now with Ford. Like, 
yes, a Ford, in, you know, an independent dealer would not want Ford corporate coming into town and go, we're just going to give the cars directly to the consumer. Obviously, that's not what Ford does. They want the dealers to have some success. Tesla's very different. Um, you know, and, and the weird thing is this kind of mentality differs from like e-commerce companies where those that don't have brick and mortar locations, those are exclusively online merchants. They're not given the same kind of behavior credence that a brick and mortar store is. There's, you know, they're not asked to file permits. They're not asked to do a number of different things. And no one's saying, hey, listen, if you want to do business in their state, you have to actually adhere to the same rules that a brick and mortar store does. But when it comes to dealerships and, and the lobbyists and everything else, it's a whole different animal. And this this time this argument time and again just really blows my mind. Why can't like it's new, it's different. I understand their failure, it's undercutting. Well, how about this? How about you other dealers start actually making cars that are, compete with Tesla at an even level and then see how you do? Because if you if people want the traditional go to a dealership, meet a salesperson, do a test drive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, guess what? You can do a lot of the same things at a Tesla location. I I, I, just, I don't understand what the the hold up or the you know why why there's so much aggravation with all of this other than lawyers and lobbyists getting involved. Like there's there's the business model seems to be just fine, just fine. Per personally, I think what should be done in these cases is just give Tesla an exemption. It's not like they're hurting anybody. I right. mean, and and it's not the first time. I mean, there, there's precedence for this. It's happened in other states. Uh, don't make a big deal about it. I, you know what? I think what's going to happen here, as they win more and more of these things, the the, the laggard states are just going to say, well, I guess we, we're not fighting this because obviously they're winning everywhere they go. And it's just le and just let it go. I mean, they're missing out on tax dollars because yeah. the people that have to buy these cars now have to go to an adjoining state to buy the car. They're mm -hmm. losing jobs because now you're not employing the people to help sell the cars. I mean, there's all these ramifications that they're just leaving money on the table as far as I'm concerned. You it's, just it's, hit the nail on the head. That's that's what's going to overturn it. Is at some point it'll grow till they can't ignore the dollars that are that are leaving the state. I think exactly. that's going to be it. It's also, it's also legacy laws, and we were seeing this in state after state after state, and sometimes province after province, which is you have <laughs> laws that are outdated. They're not you know in line with the way that the economics of things are running today, and so we have these legal fights to try to reverse or change a law that is decades old. Yeah. And it's just, it's, you know, you can't have 21st century businesses working on 19th century laws. It's just, it's something has got to give. Well, it reminds me that what region is it? It's, it's almost become urban legend, but there's some, I can't remember if it's in the U S or somewhere in England, but there's a law somewhere still in the books that, you know, in order to drive an automobile, a person must be walking in front of you with a red flag. Isn't it? I, well, I gotta go look that up. I I didn't know we would go there. I'm dying to know the well, answer. There, there are a lot of weird laws. I mean, there's exactly. there's there's laws there's removed, right? And of course, no yeah. one enforces. Them. But I mean, if you wanted to, they'd still be on the books, and the court would be within its right to to fine you for driving down the street without having your man walk in front of you with a flag. You mm -hmm. know what I want though? I really want another Tesla-like company to come out somewhere. Just in the next five to ten years, just something something competitive something marketable whatever it is and see what happens now you have two companies tesla and this other company coming out doing the exact same kind of now what now make it five now ten you know what i mean like it's it's just it's insane like i like connecticut i we you know there are buyers who want to buy a tesla in connecticut they have to go to new york like mm -hmm. new york loves having the extra income they love having those taxes it's, you know new york city is one of the largest cities in the, in the united states in terms of population like they are happy taking your money. Connecticut, which could benefit from the taxes, choose to not do it. Why? I have no idea. I don't know if it's ignorance, stupidity. I have no idea. But it's no, just it's, it's, their lobby groups. And it's the power I of the know. area. It's all I, the I people. It. And, and, and what? Well, the other thing too is that, and this is where it comes down to the citizens of these states and these provinces. If you want something to happen, you have to go fight for it. Contact your leaders make phone calls, write letters, go to their offices and tell them, look, I, I want, even if you don't want a Tesla, but if you believe they have the right to sell in your state, go make it known to them. Because even if the lobbyists come in with all this capital and all the you know, leverage that they want, it's still the legislators who actually taken their pen to paper and actually voting on something. Get it changed. It's possible mm -hmm. to do it. We don't, we, listen, it's a, it's a big thing with politics and, and Democrats and Republicans and yada, yada, yada. But it comes down to, you the power of the people if you want the change to happen start making it known and we can start seeing these things happen i'm glad the judge in this case in richmond um 
you know, in the Richmond court decided to, to make it, uh, you know, like, despite his misgivings, he said, I, I'm still not happy with the model, but the commissioner in this case has the power to say yes. And so that's what they're doing. Um, but yeah, there, there needs to be more people saying yes than no. Mm -hmm. Well, since we were just recently talking about uh, the Model 3 being the safest car, uh, we have another article here from our good friends at Inside EVs talking about how the Model 3 became the safest car. There's a great video here. We're not going to go really, uh, crazy in depth on this, but I encourage you to look at the video. I'll put a link in the uh, video in the podcast description as usual. You can really look at it. But the uh, too long didn't read version of this is basically um, a great video, by the way, by uh, the uh, Tech of Tech YouTube channel. Uh, uh, where they basically uh, explain how the car is designed in the sense that, you know, the large crumple zones in the car, the battery pack being a stress member of the vehicle. And uh, he does a fantastic job of explaining how the car is is just that safe. So I encourage you guys to go and, and check it out. Uh, great talking points. If you're talking to friends and family who are considering a Model 3 or any of the other Teslas, um, you know, because invariably safety always comes up as part of the conversation, as does, you know, how long does it take to charge and how far can you go and how much does it cost? Um, you know, these are things that people ask, of course. So uh, good talking points. Learn from this. Um, I watched the video. Very accurate. So, um Good one to watch on that one. Oh, by the way, yeah, speaking of um, safety, uh, seems to be a safety show today. Um, another article from our friends at Tesla Roddy. Uh, Tesla has finally identified the reason behind the Model S fire that, ha that happened in Shanghai. Um, they basically traced it down uh, to one of the battery modules. Now, for those of you who are not aware, the Model S and the Model X have up to 16 battery modules in the car. The Model 3 has four. Uh, so they traced it down to one of the battery modules, and they sent out a software update to change the charging. Um, I, they didn't really get into all the details as, as to exactly what they changed, but something about the charging um, timing and the state of charge um, that they changed in here. God, I can't. My glasses are not working today. Anyways, um, so this software update has gone out to the fleet. Um, I I think I might have got it. It was not alluded to any of my release notes. Um so, uh, and I'm running the latest, what is it, 20.4.2, something to that effect. Oh, by the way, no games for me. <laughs> I didn't get the beach buggy. I have an older MCU in my car, so it's definitely not happening. It's definitely tied, as far as I can tell, uh, talking to many people out there on the internet, that uh, the beach buggy 2 game is relegated to cars that have the Intel MCU. So your car has hey, to... At least you don't have to worry about your tires under your warranty. <laughs> Well, I do have to admit, I played it in my friend Dustin's car. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. The kids had a great time at it at the drive-in. How much did they watch the are, movie? I have no idea. But Are either of you guys really good at the game? I'm getting better at it. I, uh, we, we went out on a shopping expedition on the weekend, and, and part of the deal I cut was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I am sick as a dog. I'm getting to stay in the car. I'm going to play Beach Bucky while you're gone. And Bridge is like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I feel for you. So <laughs> I actually, I wouldn't call myself good, but I'm now passable. I can actually finish a game, which is the first day I was even getting to the end of the game. It was a disaster. But it's well, a lot of fun. Friend, uh, I was going to say, our friend Mike Bodner uh, on his, uh, I think his iPhone, he's got uh, the game too, the iOS game. Yeah. And uh, so he's actually practicing on that. So when he plays <laughs> in the car, he's, he's actually uh, wow. more efficient at it. He's that's like, I didn't hard. even know there was even a one before I knew there was a two. I'm like, true. That is, uh, that's very true. I, I was actually very impressed with the responsiveness of the games and, the, and uh, you know, the graphics and stuff. I, I was very impressed with that. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't play the games in my car all that much, hardly ever, actually. So it's like, okay. But um, I, I don't know. There are times it might be fun. I, you know what? For me, it's like, okay, I go to a show or something like that, and it's nice to pull up as, as a show and tell. It makes an impression, but as far as me, enter, you know, using it as an entertainment value, it's 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 not much for me, anyway. You'd rather play with your Legos. Yes. Well, okay. We'll talk about that another day. Yes, I have lots of Lego. <laughs> uh, if you guys have been a long time subscriber to a channel or viewer, you know that I have a big a big love of uh, of Lego products. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, Elon Musk. Now, Elon took to Twitter, of course, because the big concern, of course, since uh, a lot of these software updates coming, is where the heck is Enhanced Summon? You know, the dog and pony show. So this latest article comes from Tesla Roddy. Um, basically, they're really getting into uh, curbs. Um, 
it appears that the biggest holdup right now for enhanced summon, which is, you know, basically park the car up to 150 feet away, summon the car via the phone app so that it can navigate private property, parking lots, that type of thing, to come and find you. And Elon has basically taken to Twitter over the last few times, and I, I think I saw him talking about, I think it was when they were um, at the E3 show, uh, he spent some time... Uh, talking about the fact that they're spending a lot of time in the neural network trying to train the car to detect curbs. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do enhanced summon in a parking lot where you don't always have visible lines, you have to be able to see what the drivable areas are. So I think this is what they're what they're doing there. They're spending uh, a lot of time training the neural network, taking extra time to make sure that the car doesn't see things like embankments and the curbs and stuff. So I think it's it kind of explains where the delay is going to happen. They, in my opinion, they need to get this right. They can't put it out half-assed because yeah. the last thing you you're going to want to see is is a bunch of YouTube videos where the cars crash into other cars or curbs or anything like that. It's going to be a nightmare. So something like this has to be run right and it has to be done right the first time. So if they need to take another three months, take the three months. I don't care. Just yeah. get it right. Yeah, and I, I, I'm hoping that some of the um, the work for this is going to be helpful for FSD because you got to think that's one of those oh, yeah. details. You know, when the car is trying to discern undulations in the pavement or any sort of, uh, th there's got to be a lot of corner cases where you know, like, well, there's a hole in the road or there's some sort of an obstruction or whatever, and it could just be very potholes. fine shade, you know, potholes, anything where the car has to recognize a very slight difference in shape or shade or texture or something. I got to hope that uh, some of the work for this is going to apply there. Well, don't forget, it'll also help us on the reverse because this is the summon part, but eventually we're, as part of FSD is the reverse, which is what I like to explain to people. Get out of the car, press the button, and the car goes, finds its own parking space. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's all part of FSD. All of these edge corner cases have to be taken into account. This is just one of the extra steps that are coming in um, You know, that's going to make this stuff possible. And there will be others that are not disclosed at this point. So it's, it's, a, it's an evolving process, right? It's training the neural network to get this stuff right. So I think, yeah. I think the other thing, too, is when, when he takes to Twitter and makes an announcement, and then we start seeing videos leaked of those who have the early access program, you know, then people go, okay, it must be imminent. It's got to be close. And then all of a sudden yeah. there's like silence in the airwaves and people start clamoring for it and they start asking, well, what happened? Why, why is it no longer a thing? Well, it could be that those EAP tests provided data points for the AI team and others to go, okay, now we know we need to, we need to go fix. You know, we saw these logs and it showed, you know, these five, six different data points and we want to fix those. And it's just, it's continual coding and testing and coding and testing. So uh, like anything else, it's a matter of being patient. I mean, look, I ordered a Model 3 in 2016. <laughs> I waited three years to get my car, you know, two years to get my car. So patience is a virtue in this case. But because of the excitement of this feature and because of what we've already seen so far, people are going, okay, I want that now. But it's just, it is going to take longer. I mean, look, look, some of the top engineers in the world, in the world, are working on this. Um, so give them time. It's not a huge team of people. Uh, and they're trying to make sure that is like like Trevor said, you got to do it right because the minute there's one report of uh, a bump in a parking lot, uh, you know, an animal got run over, uh, you know, heaven forbid, a person gets hit or something, now it's a problem. You got you got to get this right from day one. And and don't fool yourself; it will happen. It's just what you have to do is make sure that you uh, minimize the chances of that happening. So, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect vehicle. There's no such thing as perfect anything in the world. So this stuff will happen. And unfortunately, somebody's going to get hurt. And it's just, I mean, it's just statistics are working on your side as far as that's concerned. So, yeah, again, be patient. Let's uh, let's wait and make sure that it gets happened and uh, or it gets out in time. And uh, we'll see what, uh, what transpires with that. It is in the early access program. Um, so it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of when. It's not if. Um, right, so that's mostly what we had to talk about this week. Um, Ian, I want you to talk a little bit about your your experience with with trans uh, with with the EV flotilla. My, boy, my my mind is not working <laughs> today. I'm having a tough time do with you, my mouth. Do you need yourself a mini pie or something? Are you no, okay? I think what's happening is I'm suffering from an Elonism where my mind is. 50 feet down the road, my mouth is not catching up. No, um, Ian, you had a chance there last week where you um, uh, participated in the uh, in the EV traversing of the new Champlain Bridge in Montreal. So, uh, got a little report for us? Let us know how that went. 
I did. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of our listeners, uh, viewers might have seen the video that you put together. I had I'd taken some video of it and you expertly stitched it together with some uh, awesome background shots on the construction of the bridge, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, maybe, Trev, you can fire off a link for that for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, but yeah, that was um, kind of a very last minute thing. Just weeks before the scheduled opening of the bridge, uh, LAVEC, l'Association des Véhicules Électriques de Québec, uh, partnered up with Club Tesla Québec and uh, put together this idea that the first vehicles to cross the bridge uh, should be electrics because obviously there's a huge push in Quebec. We're very much behind the EV movement with very strong incentive program here, rebates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they thought this would be appropriate, you know, to sort of signal in the new age. Um, for those of you who are not local, the Champlain Bridge uh, was originally constructed back in the early 1960s. And the structure itself was pretty well worn. Um, it got declared um, basically, <clears throat> it was on borrowed time a couple of years ago. Um, the main structure was starting to fail, as a lot of bridges and overpasses and things in Quebec were. Mm -hmm. So, this is a main bridge that connects, uh, it's the largest of all the arteries, the main bridges that connect uh, the South Shore area of, to Montreal Island. So, it's pretty critical that they get this one right. So, they did a beautiful job designing this thing. The new one is absolutely stunning. It's quite a bit taller, wider uh, than the original. And it's also going to have a light rail um, section that goes through the center of it to boost um, the mass transit capabilities. That's a great uh, idea. It is, yeah, it was, it was very well thought out. They were a little behind on the execution. It took them about an extra six months to get it done. A few scandals here and there, but hey, it's construction <laughs> in Quebec. Yeah, the, the few scandals that there were sort of amazed me. It was 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 progress. You, you can't have construction in Quebec without some kind no. of scandal, right? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. Exactly. So yeah, these these uh, these two organizations got together with uh, the powers that be and uh, managed to get authorization to do this. So they fired out an invitation about a week before the opening to anybody with an EV to come on out. And the way they did it was they uh, they were fearful of trying to get all these cars in one spot at the same time. As it was, we got over 520 cars. I don't know what the quite the final count was, but just to make sure that we didn't completely log jam one neighborhood, they spread it over four parking lots, uh, all within a couple of miles of the, uh, the bridge entrance. And then the real trick was coordinating so that all four lots, you know, each with about 125, 130 cars, converged on the highway at the same time so that we formed one continuous chain of 500 EVs crossing the bridge. So that took a little bit longer than expected. Um, so we didn't quite get there for 5 a.m. for the opening. We were a few minutes behind. So when you watch the video, you'll see there's there's some nasty ice cars and buses mixed into this <laughs> parachute. But we did we did steal the scene. We we stole the show. It was it was still a beautiful long line of and an amazing number of Model Threes. It yes. goes to show how many of these cars there are in Quebec now. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of these cars here, but they're so spread out. Like on a daily basis, I'll see a couple here and there. But I mean, I was in a parade of them, like every color, variety, option. Like they were all there. There was there was lots of us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, any EV you can imagine, you know, from IVFs to Bolts to Sparks to Leafs. I mean, you name it. We, we were out there in strength. It was, it was a lot of fun. Just hanging out with the owners at the beginning was a riot. You know, we were all geared up about a half an hour just hanging out there and then we rolled out but it was beautifully done i mean they they handled the intersection and the on-ramps and everything and it just it went off without a hitch it was super super well done oh, i'm looking forward to uh to uh to seeing it soon i'm coming down to quebec next week late next week no yes. two weeks from now uh, what's the date i was losing track of my dates now it's a week and a half Let's call it. It's not on the, on the 10th. Week. I'm going down for a family uh, event and stuff. So um, I'm meeting up with Ian and stuff. We'll do some stuff together. I anyway, so like yeah, I'm looking forward to it. is like losing its functionality as the show is going on. We're not even an hour into this and you're like brain dead this whole thing. Are you okay? Um, I'm sick guy here. Hell. Just one of those. Yeah, did you eat a banana today? Like, do you, do you need something to eat right now? Can we get Beverly over here to, to no, give no, you no, food? no, no? We we had dinner. We're 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 good. We're good. All right. Well, thanks, Ian, for that report. Um, like I said, I'll I'll put some video over top of some of that what he was talking about. So if you can see it in case you happen to miss it, but I I will put a link in the v, uh, in the podcast in the video description as you guys can watch it if you want. Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. 
Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. I want to take just a couple of minutes here before we get into the viewer questions and talk about this new product. If you guys maybe have seen my video that I put out today, this is the new Jetta wire or not wireless. I got to get my, my brain straight. This is the new Jetta USB hub for the Model 3. Uh, they were kind enough to send me a, uh, a a production sample, minus the final packaging. But anyways, it's a really cool device. It's designed to plug in where your USB ports are in your center console. There's two USB ports on the back there. So this is designed to actually clip into there. And, uh, you know, I've been using uh, the pr uh, the uh, prototype that they sent me, I guess it was about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, in a car. And I have to say, when this is installed in the car, it doesn't... It, it doesn't look out of place. It looks like it's part of the car, which is really cool. And it has some really unique features. Um, so the first thing you need to know is that it, it gives you two USB-A ports on the front, two USB-C ports on the front, which has always been a problem. You know, people are always saying, why did Tesla not give us USB-C? Well, there you go. Now you get USB-C. But the best part about it is that there's a little door here in the front, which is held on with magnets. So if you just push down in one of the corners, it just lifts off. <gasps> and you have a secret hidden compartment inside with another USB port right here in the corner where you can put in, say, your dash cam, USB stick, or something for um, sentry mode, whatever. In this case here, what I have installed here is an SSD. This is a 500 uh, gigabyte um, Samsung T5 solid state drive. So it's, and it's held on magnetically. See that? They give you this, um, this little sticky piece of metal here that you put on the back of the drive, and they've actually hidden magnets behind the... Um, uh, the silicone red mat that they have on the back there. and It just kind of sits in there, so it doesn't rattle around when it's inside the car. So anyways, really well executed, I thought. Um, again, there's been a lot of talk on the internet um, about uh, one of the things the Model 3 doesn't have is it doesn't really have a lot of juice coming out of the USB ports. So, the, so this doesn't amplify the juice, but it does spread the load across depending on what you have plugged into it. So it's not an ideal solution for powering all of the devices in your car and charging all of your phones simul simultaneously, but at least you can get a little bit of a charge out of your devices. But I think it's really nice to, to be able to be able to um, plug this in and then put a, a hidden compartment in there so you can put in you know, uh, like a USB stick or in this case here, a solid state drive to store your dash cam footage um, and having a pass through for the USB port. So if you have their wireless charger or somebody else's wireless charger, as well as a couple of USB-C ports, which is something, of course, that people have been asking for. So anyways, I like the product so far. We'll see how it uh, transpires. Um, I'm seeing that um, it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of um, activity on the internet. People really like it. it. Sells for 79 bucks US. If you're current owner of the Jetta Pad, either version one or version two, you get a $10 discount. Um, I know some people on the internet were saying uh, 79 bucks. I think it's a bit of expensive. I think in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's that expensive. I think it would do even better if it was 49 bucks. Um, but it is what it is. And um, I mean, hey, it's the only one on the market of its sort. And then you don't have to deal with a whole bunch of cables and this rat nest underneath your sender console. So definitely check it out if you're interested in this. I'll put a link down in the video description. Um, in the podcast. Uh, full disclosure, they sent me this for free. I didn't pay for it. And the link is uh, my referral link. So they throw me a couple bucks if you buy one. I just like them. They're a plucky little company. They got some really great ideas. I think um, they, they did say publicly that they are working on a possibility of um, a wireless module for this. So either through a stick or maybe some kind of future revision, whatever, will it will actually generate a, a Wi-Fi hotspot so that you'll be able to perhaps log into it with your phone to be able to pull the footage because obviously that's the biggest thing. I mean, I know Ian, you talked about your USB stick, uh, which is the Kingston one, I think it is, that has the wire, uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot built in. Uh, I, um, I like again, until Tesla gets around to give us a software update where we can actually pull the footage remotely from the cars, but uh, that's my plug on that product. I think it's cool. All right, I think it's time to uh, get into viewer questions and answers. So let's get in here. So the first question comes from Eric. He says, I have some water spots on the windows of my Model 3 and somehow did not know that you aren't supposed to wash your car in the hot Texas sun or Florida for that matter, wherever. Uh, he says he found a product online by the chemical guys um, 
He says, would this be safe to polish on my windows uh, or what product would you recommend? I also have paint protection film. Is it safe to use optimum no rinse? Wow, there's lots of questions in there, Eric. Um, so I'm not familiar with the Chemical Guys product you're talking about. I personally use either Windex or um, Invisible Glass, almost the same thing, and that seems to work quite well. I think if you're going to wash your car in the hot sun, you want to try and use as little tap water as possible because of the minerals in there. Uh, if you're already using Optimum No Rinse, uh, try it with some distilled water. Mm -hmm. That might help. Uh, like I said, Invisible Glass or Windex or whatever, we can take those water spots off. But if you want to eliminate the water spots, again, try not to wash it in the direct sunlight. Wait for the afternoon. Uh, you know, do it in the shade as much as possible. I know you can't always do that, but uh, but uh, since you're always using Optimum No Rinse, it's perfectly safe to use on the paint protection film. But just try it with some distilled water. I think that might help you. Two other suggestions, because I live in Florida, so we yep. wash cars here in the sun is tough. Uh, if you get a chance, go to Tesla Tunity on YouTube. Our friend Michael put a video together of detailing his car. Uh, he shows you some of the products. He actually does use some products from Chemical Brothers uh, in the video, as you can kind of take a look at that. The second thing is um, you want to try to use microfiber cloths on the glass whenever you can. That will also help to make sure you're not being too abrasive so as not to ruin the glass. Uh, and that will help. Try to have one for applying your cleaner and another dry one for actually having it taken off. That should also help alleviate some of your spots. Yes. I don't think there's enough people out there that really know how to wash a car without damaging the paint as much as they, they think they do. There are methods. Well, the, other, the other thing, too, is that, if, and, and you know, I've been to Texas a few times. Like, it is one of those states where if you're washing your car, especially here in the southeast, it's difficult most of the day because of the amount of sun we get. Yeah. So you either have to wash it really early in the morning or you have to wash it at night uh, as the sun starts to set. If you don't have a garage like I don't, um, it is more difficult to have to wash your car, especially if you live in an area where you're restricted on water usage or when you can wash your car or if you can even wash it outside, et cetera, et cetera. So be mindful of your local ordinances. But if you if you're able to, Eric, if you're able to wash your car uh, you know, after hours when it's a little darker, or if you're able to do it, even just parking it under a tree in the shade. Uh, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but anything you do to minimize the amount of sun in your car will also do a lot of good. Yeah. One, one last thing on that, not to beat it to death, is uh, do it in stages if you have to. Even here in Montreal on a super hot day, I can run into that same problem. So what I'll do is yeah. I'll typically wash the top of the car, then do mm -hmm. the bottom section. And I, so you do the whole top, then rinse immediately. And even before I wash the bottom, Dry I'll it. take yeah, exactly. Take your drying towel, your chamois, whatever you do, and just do the glass. If nothing else, get all mm -hmm. that excess water off the glass before it has a chance to dry. That makes a huge difference. Yep. I, I will give you one more recommendation, Eric, if you're listening. Um, I go to Walmart and I buy the their, their purple high pile microfiber drying cloths, and they're huge. They're about three feet by three feet square. They sell for about 10 bucks. Buy a couple of those. They work fabulous for drying off um, the water on your car. So yes, uh, Eric is absolutely right. That's uh, or I uh, should say, Ian, uh, draw, do your car in stages. I always start with the roof, and then I work on the glass, and I just work my way down to the dirtiest part of the car. Never start from the bottom, work your way up. That's Ooh. that's that's very bad for the paint. And the right. best time to wash your car is in the morning because it's actually had the entire night so the metal's not hot. If you try to wash it in the evening, it's actually it's going to dry a lot faster because of the amount of heat in the metal. Okay, so I, I just I was just delivered the solution to my mental block today. I've got some chocolate banana muffins. See, you thank you, Beverly. What the hell? I told you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> nutmeg. <laughs> all right. Oh, all right. It smells too good. Rubbing all right, moving on. on. <laughs> all right, I'm coming over. She I'll says it's later. hot, so I can't burn my mouth. <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Pedro, who lives in Portugal. He uh, has a question about Tesla insurance. He says, did Tesla provide any guidance on uh, what would keep Tesla insurance the lowest as far as driving? So I'm guessing those early owner acceleration accelerations can't help. Uh, unfortunately, Pedro, we really don't have any information on uh, Tesla insurance at this point. Um, looking forward to it. The moment we have about it, uh, information on that, we will certainly talk about it. Um, again, if, if they launch this thing on in due time, it's going to be U.S. thing only, at least at first. Uh, regulations, as far as if, uh, insurance are concerned all over the world, are vary by jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a blanket thing right away. So just be patient about that. And, uh, you know, like I said, as soon as we have some information, we'll talk about that. 
Uh, next question comes from Tom. He says, people are spreading a rumor on Facebook about the Model 3's 12-volt battery that has to be replaced annually, claiming a Tesla Ranger told them. Any truth to that? Oh, Facebook. A rumor on Facebook? I've never heard of that. Who would spread rumors right. on Facebook? <laughs> okay. uh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> go for it. Uh-oh. Oh, top of the Eric. He's <laughs> broke the internet. Interrupted. I love it. Oh. He broke the internet. <laughs> Eric was just about to break the internet. <laughs> oh, the timing could not be better. Florida. He's... Oh my gosh. There we go. There we Dude, go. that was the funniest thing ever. Just as you started to froth into like a I rage. Know. It was like, that was no, that was awesome. <laughs> so All right, Thanks, Eric. Here's page. your chance. All right. So, like I was saying, uh, so number one, whenever you see rumors, or especially if you're going to ask the question using, hey, I've heard a rumor, this is not an Adele song. Seriously. it's Don't it's even bother over. bringing that to our attention. Uh, the second thing is, I do understand that there's this insatiable desire to delve into everything Tesla-related. And the minute you hear a story that sounds intriguing, you want to kind of like hone in on it, you want to read it, you want to know everything about it, and go, hey, is this true? This sounds amazing. This is interesting, et cetera, et cetera. The thing with the battery is this. Now, I, for one, I'll just tell my story. I've had my car now for 14 months. I've never had an issue starting my car, driving the car, anything. If the 12-volt battery had to be replaced every single year, you would see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all the time on Tesla forums, it. on the two forum, on everywhere going, what's with the batteries? If you're telling me that a 12-volt battery in a, any car, any car, has it replaced once a year? Something's wrong with that car. And I can't imagine an opera. Like the 12 volt battery is meant to be like an, a backup for the tiniest of things. The car is back. Like we're driving an electric car that has a huge battery pack. <laughs> I, I don't understand. <sighs> okay. All right. It's enough. A rumor. Don't. Well, just me, don't. It's I false. Know, I'm going to give it a tiny little bit of credence and not this particular instance. <gasps> Oh, I know. No, no, I'm not. It doesn't discount anything you said. Everything you said, Eric, is 100% valid. <laughs> Rest assured. But if you do recall, in the early days of Model S, there were some weird issues with the 12-volt battery. And I think it was the way that it was being charged. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know enough. I don't recall enough of the original technical reasons why they were failing. But they And it wasn't within a year. I mean, I think there are a few rare here, rare cases. But it was like after two, not even three years, they, there was, and I mean, not a large number of them either. But it was kind of weird, right? Because if we look at 12-volt batteries, you know, in ICE cars, they're usually good for five, six, seven years at least. So I will, so, I will say this. <clears throat> there are still occasions when the 12-volt battery has to replace on an S or an X. It's still... It, it still happens, not as frequent as it used to, but mm -hmm. I'm still hearing stories of it happening. Now, my car's been no issues with the battery. The Model 3, there were an early rash of cars that had to have the batteries replaced, and this was largely because when the people first got the cars, they were trying to tap into 12-volt power to power things like dash cams. Now, mm -hmm. as we know, the Model 3 doesn't have fuses like an S or an X does, so they were going straight to the battery. And of course, when you're doing that, uh, you know, the car would freak out and eventually would throw some kind of air and stuff. So I don't know what his particular situation is or what the person's situation is as far as the battery was concerned, whether they were tapping into it. There's a way to tap in to get 12 volt without going directly into the battery. You have to go into the VDC modules. There's a, it's a story for another, for another day. But again, we have to be careful because we don't know exactly what the circumstances are. But Eric is absolutely right. Changing the battery once a year is false. It does not happen to... Uh, that's not true. So, uh, yeah, ignore it. It's not true. <laughs> Moving along. All right, next question comes. I'm going to go to this one here from My Tesla Dream. Way to use your uh, your Twitter feed in there. Your, ha your handle says, do you think the MCU upgrade will be available for Autopilot 2.0 owners either the, uh, after FSD computer upgrade? How much would it be? Oh, boy. Uh, story of my life. Um, now, for those of you who know, the, the, the MCU, uh, and, I, and I'm still seeing confusion about this on the Internet, the MCU is the main computer unit, okay? So in an S or an X, that is the computer that drives the big 17-inch screen um, that's in the center of the dash. There is another computer that drives the instrument cluster on the S and X, and then there's a third computer that is responsible for the autopilot. 
stuff, okay? So in an S or an X, you have three main computers. So when we say MCU, we're talking about the main screen in the car. It has nothing to do with autopilot, okay? Now, on the Model 3, because you don't have the instrument cluster, you have an MCU and an autopilot computer, but they're bundled together, two circuit boards, back-to-back, -back, in a housing that's on the firewall on, on, the, um, on the inside of the car, deep inside the dash, okay? So it, it doesn't have three computers. It essentially has two. So going back, there has been some confusion, including myself, who, who have been asking Elon for some time ago, because Elon did allude to the fact at one time um, that there would be a main computer upgrade for older S's and X's because as my understanding is as of March 2018, um, the S's and X's got the new Intel chip set that's actually running the main computer in the Model 3. Uh, the way you can tell those cars is very easy. If you look at the, uh, the dash trim on an S and X, if it's not the silver, it's the dark carbon color. That's an MCU 2 or Intel MCU equipped car. Uh, they changed that dash trim at the same time when they switched to the Intel chips. Okay, so uh, so let's let's not get MCU upgrades confused with autopilot. That's a separate thing altogether. So if you paid for FSD, um, that will upgrade the autopilot computer. It has nothing to do with the with the main screen. Now the the reason I don't have all the same features as the Model Three, including the Beach Buggy Two, is because I have a Tegra uh, three powered. The chip that's running the uh, main MCU is, is a Tegra 3. It's not the Intel chip. So uh, it's a different platform. It's a different code base. It's, you know, it's a whole bunch of other things. So I hope that answers the question. We don't know. Elon alluded to the fact that it was going to be upgradable. I haven't heard anything. I've been bugging Tesla service for months. Um, they say, we don't know. It's When it shows up in the system, we'll know. I mean, otherwise. So at this point, I'm kind of like throwing in the towel. I, th I don't think it's going to happen. It just doesn't seem to be in their wheelhouse at this point. So if they do do it, great. But right now, I just don't. I don't think it's it's really happening. It's just it's going to be a situation. If I want Beach Buggy 2, I'm just going to have to sell my car and buy a new one. Mono Y? Don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Let's put it this way. If, if they were to upgrade the Model X, let's say with a new battery and maybe a new interior, uh, part of me would be like, I might upgrade. But right now, not interested. Performance Model X with Ludacris. Because I would get Ludacris for free. Oh, that's right. You would. Yeah. No, yeah. That's intriguing. Yeah, a friend of mine actually... Um, um, Luda. Yeah, a friend of mine, Justin, just upgraded his, and he got the he got the Ludacris upgraded because he had an older Model X and he sold it. He had a ninety D and he sold it, and he got a new hundred D and he got the Ludacris for free because he was an existing customer. Um, so, anyways, all right. Next question comes from Natalie. Uh, actually, this is a question for Ian. It says I saw the EV one three D rendering prototype at the Montreal EV show back in May. He's talking talking about your new wheels there i'm um, still debating whether ev1 for range or fco4s for performance on my model 3 uh, has a long range rear wheel drive is it possible to have an update on the ev1 production please will it be available by the end of summer or early fall it's so funny you asked that because there was a lot of running back and forth uh, today at the office we're trying to dial in the delivery dates on the wheel we haven't quite it got it yet uh what we're waiting on right now is the uh, aerodynamic testing samples i'm hoping 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 that they're going to be here in about two weeks time and then we're going to be going off to um, pmg which is transport canada's testing research facility here in uh, in quebec and doing all the aero tests on them to see how they do so Assuming that all goes well and we green light them for production, I'm hoping to see them end of October. That's sort of what our target date is right now. Everything so far looks good. Um, on glass or whatever, wood fake stuff. This is. <laughs> Ikea particle yeah, board. Exactly. Um, but yeah, that's so we're, we're really hoping to get actual wheels in the building by the end of October uh, at this stage. So um, fingers have, crossed. Have you guys announced pricing on that yet? Not officially, no. Okay. Uh, that should be soon. The pricing should be up on the websites, uh, I would think, within a couple of weeks. So look by uh, the end of the month. You should actually see the pricing out on the system. Uh, any any of the, the retailers that advertise our stuff should have it up there. So you'll, you'll be able to see exact pricing quite soon. And then hopefully okay. with the products coming in, uh, like I said, in end of October. Okay. Well, as soon as you know, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll get the word out for you. 
yeah, no, uh, much appreciated. Okay. Next question comes from Lester. He says, is there a highway speed that gives you the best range and uh, without f sacrificing too much speed? Eric? So here in the United States, uh, what I found is that if I'm driving under 70 miles per hour, I'm getting the best efficiency in the battery and I'm getting the best range out of my car. Once you go over 70, you lose a little bit. Once you eclipse 80, watch out. That's where you're really drawing a lot of energy for the car to maintain that speed. Now, again, you're able to obviously see how your car's performance is based on the wonderful line they give you uh, right below your speedometer. So obviously, if you're in the green, that's regen energy going back into your battery pack. If you see the black, that's actually using your energy. And of course, the further to the right on the line, the more energy you're drawing out of the battery pack. So if you have to swerve lanes and you're accelerating quickly to pass another vehicle or something like that, in that few seconds you're doing it, sure, you're going to lose a little bit of energy. But again, if you're driving uh, at speeds of over 70, you're going to see a significant drop. If you go well over 80, you're really going to see a drop. Uh, so that's what I found here. Again, that's miles per hour. If you live in other climates where you have kilometers per hour, and we were talking about this before the show, uh, some areas might even want to increase speeds. There's been some highways in this country where um, the speed limits are 55 miles per hour because that was a time when that was when the most fuel efficiency you could get out of a car was at that speed. Now some highways are 65, 70 miles per hour. Some places there's not even posted speed limits uh, at all. Uh, but yeah, if you want to get the best range, try to keep it under 70 if you can, uh, but definitely keep it under 80 uh, whenever possible. Okay. Just just to expand on that slightly, there's been a lot of testing of people who've trying to break the range numbers, both on Model S's and Model 3's, and they both seem to hit their absolute peak efficiency at, believe it or not, about 28 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah that's true. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to remember, we're driving through a fluid, Yeah. right? And, 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 and I don't have the math in front of me, but I think, basically, it's like a logarithmic scale. It basically, it's like a big hockey stick as you go up. So the faster you go, the more air resistance and the more power it takes. I think it's the square. The it's square exactly that. Your dynamic right? in, uh, resistance increases with the square of your speed. So every time you double your speed, you quadruple the wind resistance. So think about that. I mean, if the car maximizes its efficiency at around 30 miles an hour, to go 60 miles an hour, you need to use four times the energy. That's right. Uh, to go 120 miles an hour, you need to use eight times the energy. So that's why what Eric's describing is very true. The, the difference is between 60, 70, and 80 miles an hour. You'd think in your mind, oh, it's only going to use, what, another 10 or 15% of my, my consumption. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it goes up by a factor of, you know, 20, 25%. Just right. Between those those little changes, in don't speed. forget if you use other energy consumption things in the car, like heat, brutal in the winter, AC. Um, that will use up energy as well. Although AC, uh, in my opinion, uh, doesn't yeah. use anywhere near the amount of energy as heating uh, of a car. That's, and a that's the funny energy. thing. That's where it kind of gets weird because the heat becomes pretty significant. You know, you're using thousands of watt of heating. So up here in the Great White North, it actually pays to go a little faster in winter. Um, that that ideal speed of 28 miles an hour is assuming you're not using any AC or any heat. If I was to to turn on a significant amount of heat. Uh, I'm probably better off going a little bit quicker because I'll be in the car less time. I won't be heating mm -hmm. for as long. So going a little quicker sort of mitigates the loss from, from the heater. But uh, yeah, I mean, the slower you go down to about 30 miles an hour, the farther you're going to go. It's just a question of how long can you stand it? But honestly, I, I found certainly on the long trips I've done so far because of the supercharging network and the speed the car recharges at, um, you don't really have to worry about it. If I was going outside the, the supercharger range, like way up north or into some rural area where I had to maximize range, I really want to back off the speed to make sure that I make it there. But here's the funny thing. Uh, when you're driving on the supercharger network, the faster you go, the better off you are. You, you I think <laughs> up to about 100 miles an hour, the, the return rate is better because even using a huge amount more energy, the car can recharge literally yeah, at hundreds you, of You end up hitting hour. the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. As mm -hmm. long as you only charge the car to 80, 85 percent, you're you're off. You're better off just driving the thing flat out. You know, 80, 90, mm -hmm. whatever. Just get away with in the zone. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, if you if you seriously needed to conserve every last mile, then it's just a question of slower is better. Uh, well, and why you, you mentioned that? The other thing I look at too is when I drive, I sort of look at the my watts per hour on my vehicle. So oftentimes I'm in like the 230, 235 range, which is a very efficient drive uh, for me. 
Um, I've seen some people drive well over 300 watts per mile, which of course is someone who's really kind of flooring it. I, yes, I know. <laughs> yes, Ian waves his hand for those of you uh, on the podcast. <laughs> right. If Ian's below 300, he's doing something wrong. So, yes. so, I'm, so I'm with you. We, we, I mean, we, if you, if you understand electric vehicles, yes, your best efficiency is driving at city limit speeds versus highway speeds uh, because of the regen benefit you get from electric car. Uh, same goes for hybrids. Uh, a Prius will get better efficiency driving local than highway. Um, but yeah, I, I, I try not to, like, if I'm at a stop, I try not to floor it off the start. Uh, there's just little things I do. And I, I also have the factory 18 inch wheels on my Model 3. So that also adds a little bit of range efficiency back onto the car. About 5 to 10% is added on. And I do predominantly highway mileage. So that's actually a nice benefit. Uh, so I'm almost getting mile for mile a true equal equivalency um, with that. So that being said, you know, how you drive is almost as important as how fast you're driving. Uh, so keep that in mind too. And, and, you know, to Ian's point, if you're running your wipers, your lights, you got your heaters on, like, you know, all the different things you're basically doing to run the car also can affect your performance and your, uh, your range. Okay. Well, Lester, I hope that answers your question. Uh, last question of the evening comes from Steve. He says, why is Tesla not using the internal camera to monitor if the driver is paying attention? Actually, maybe I should reread that because I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, why is Tesla not using the internal camera to monitor if the driver is paying attention? There you go. Uh, <laughs> we've talked about this before. So Elon has made it official. The plan for the camera facing the inside of the cabin, that's the one above your rear view mirror in the Model 3, is for monitoring passengers when they get to the robo-taxi fleet. Right now, they are not using the system. There has been lots and lots of discussion. We talked about this just before the show began with both Lex Friedman um, and Alex Roy, who are both, um, I mean, Lex is, you know, at MIT. Roy is a very well-known uh, auto journalist who's very much into ADAS systems. Um, and they both seem to feel that uh, driver monitoring is almost a requirement um, at least at this stage of the game, um, I mean, somebody would make an argument when you get to level four, level five, do you still really need it at that point? Because at that point, when the car is fully autonomous, do you really need to be paying attention to the driver at that point? So I think, I think the consensus is, and I, Ian, you had spoken about this, that you, you seem to feel that, and I would probably agree, the more you think about it, maybe, maybe it should be put in and thought about or actually implemented uh, before we actually get to level four and level five. Yeah, that, that was my thought when we talked about it early in the show. I My feeling is when you're talking level four, level five systems where they're certified by regulatory bodies as being safe enough to drive themselves, well, no, what's, what's the point? I mean, that's the whole thing. The car can literally wander around with no one in it perfectly safely. So I don't see the point there. And, you know, again, going back to what Elon talked about during um, uh, the full uh, self-driving day or autonomy day or whatever it was called for the investors, yeah. that was his point. You know, uh, whenever he's been pressed on this, they, with the Lex Friedman interview, it was very much the same thing. He's like, well, we're going to get to FSD so soon that, you know, to, to waste a lot of our time on driver monitoring doesn't seem like a, the best use of our resources. In, in the moment when he said that, I thought, yeah, I totally buy that. But the only thing it bypasses is not everybody is going to opt in for FSD. So everybody who has regular autopilot, which is really a, a level two, 2.5, whatever you want to call it, system, um, does that mean we should have driver monitoring? And after spending a lot of time listening to Lex, who I tremendously respect, uh, you know, this guy is, is one of the world leaders on it. I mean, that's what they're studying at MIT under his programs. Um, I think we've got good data to support it right now because I think the majority of Tesla owners are using it responsibly. I mean, Lex's own data, he's one of the first to do an extensive uh, study on it at MIT to show that, yes, your car, uh, Tesla's running autopilot, uh, have better safety, um, you know, less, fewer accidents uh, than, than vehicles being driven without it. So, you know, without the driver monitoring, we can already see that there's a huge improvement, but could it be better with it? Um, again, like going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, for everyone else's benefit, I feel that right now we're sort of in the early days where people are still quite conscious and very responsible with it, but it's like anything else. Once it goes into wide, wide distribution and it just becomes another thing that's part of every car and we'll get there at some point, you know, most cars are going to have at least some limited autopilot capability. Um, will it start to be abused? That's what I yeah. worry about. Um, and only time will tell. 
but I think there is a certain value of adding it um, to these basic systems that are not fully autonomous. Because, uh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll get to a point, uh, and then I'll let Eric chime in because I know Eric, you're of a different mind on this. I totally respect your view on it. That's why we're here, and I love that we we don't always agree on these things. I think that's one of the things that makes the show interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what also partially changed my mind is I just finished reading uh, Jason Torchinsky's book, uh, Robot Take the Wheel. And uh, it's a fascinating book for a lot of reasons. I'll, I'll maybe we'll do a little review on it at some point, and uh, we'll talk about it more in, in detail. But he worries extensively about the half in, half out quality of autopilot, where you feel like the car is driving, but you still have to pay attention. He says the human mind's not really wired for that task. So that's that's kind of what played into my hmm. Maybe once it really gets into wide release, we got to be cautious about it. But anyway, my two cents, Mr. Camacho, please. Okay, so uh, well thought out. I, I, I do respect the opinions of those people you've mentioned uh, and as well as yours. Here's, here's the thing that I struggle with, and it really comes down to privacy. So there's a lot of dialogue nowadays, uh, especially when it comes to things like social media, uh, about privacy, where, where your data is being used. Uh, we know that Google is, is in the news quite often for the way it stores data. Uh, Amazon and Apple, you know, Apple tries to talk about in every presentation they have about how we're not, you know, we believe in privacy. We're not using your data. We don't store the things you ask Siri and things like that. Um, Amazon uh, has all these d devices now in people's homes that like, unless the user knows they're there, it's actually storing all that data. So I, I do, I do take um, umbrage with the idea that there's a camera in my car that at some point could be turned on and monitor everything that I'm doing in that car without my consent. Now, if it's for a safety reason, I understand the people that would say, well, you know, obviously, like you said, for, for driver monitoring, you know, if there's an accident, it's, it's more evidence of an investigation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would argue that police and, and accident investigators have been doing just fine, figuring that stuff out for decades. We, it's, it's easy to find out where, you know, they, they look at crash scenes and they can do their surveys and figure out, you know, what happened based on, um, you know, uh, witnesses and, and firsthand testimonials and everything else. Like the dash cam video would be an extra point of evidence, but it, but I still, I still do not believe that it should infringe a person's right to privacy. And when you're in your car, what you do in your car is in some way private. Um, obviously if you're driving the car and you're in motion as others in the car, you know, out people outside your car don't hear your conversations. Uh, they don't see whether or not a person's playing a game when they're like, there's a certain things you, do, you just can't tell, you know, they're in the car, you know, they're obviously doing something sociable, but you can't get wind of everything. I, I just, I don't believe that even with, with those cars you mentioned that are somewhat autopilot centric, but don't have FSD. I still believe that any person driving a car does not want to be filmed doing everything. Um, so I, I would rather they didn't do this. Uh, but you know, I, 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 there's, there, there's, there's good arguments made on both sides of this. I just, I just believe wholeheartedly in privacy and, you know, when I'm in my car, I don't want to be filmed doing anything. I wouldn't want someone outside my car filming me in my car. I wouldn't want my own camera in my car doing that, uh, for the robo taxi. If I, if I were to put my car on the network, and someone else is driving it, that's totally fine. We've talked in the show in the past about just even having cars with no steering wheel. Yeah, in that point, fine. I want to make sure that no one's damaging my car. But me, camera's off. Well, let me state for the record, I'm with you. I'm not a big fan of having, you know, Big Brother watching me while I'm driving either. The idea is a little bit creepy to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I just, I'm kind of in a gray zone on it where... Uh, I think the numbers will tell the tale. We're, we're going to have to see as as it the technology spreads and as more and more drivers get to use it. You know, if if the numbers stay, you know, consistently show that the cars are twice as safe without it, uh, I think we can make a good argument that it isn't required. But someone could easily say, well, yeah, but what if you activate driver monitoring and now all of a sudden those those partial you know driving systems are four times as safe? Aren't we morally obliged to 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 go to the best? level we can with the technology mm -hmm. it's not a yeah it, it's not a simple argument um i i'm not crazy about the idea either i love the fact that you know currently no one is watching me and the, the system i find the system super safe but i don't know 
we'll have to see where it all goes. Well, definitely food for thought. Um, if any of you are watching or listening out there and you have your own thoughts, I mean, put them down in the comments and we'd love to be able to hear back from what you think. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a good uh, topic for conversation for that type of thing. I mean, I agree with both of you on both sides. I mean, we want our privacy. But at the other hand, we want... Um, we want our chicken. We want to eat it too, damn it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that basically brings us to the end of the show. Uh, since Ian, you're on the screen, why don't you uh, tell us what you, uh, where people can have uh, a chit chat with you, or whatever you want to plug? Well, um, at uh, on Twitter, you can find me at Ian Pavelko. On um, Tesla Owners Online, you can find me as the Mad Hungarian. Mad Space Hungarian would be the handle there. So, any questions and conversations just strike strike up. And I always like to make the distinction: if it's a real quick question or just you know to pester me about some little fun thing, by all means, hit me up on Twitter. If you want to know anything in great detail, well, then let's go to Tesla Owners Online because we have all sorts of great technical forums there, and I'm happy to answer questions, not necessarily even publicly. I mean, you can. DM me uh, on either forum and uh, either on, on both and, you know, happy to answer questions either way. That's what we have it for. Exactly. And then finally, I have my uh, little t-shirt shop at uh, teespring.com, Mad Hungarian Evolve Wear at uh, teespring.com. And uh, if you'd like to support the uh, EV organizations around North America, you would be doing so by purchasing any of the products there. And that's about it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Eric, where can people find you if they want to have a chat with you? You guys can find me on Twitter at the handle EC Fix. You might see it on the screen. We're not sure how this is going to work. Again, we're still <laughs> kind of working all the kinks out here. Uh, but you can find me at EC Fix. I have 800 and some odd followers right now. Uh, I'm tempted to do a contest for whoever my thousand followers. I might actually give them a free gift. We'll see. Uh, but uh, appreciate all the comments and questions. And thanks to Nicholas, who before the show, you remember my tweet from last week saying we weren't going to be doing a show last week. Yes, I saw that. Uh, and Ashley even asked us, like, hey, you guys doing a show again tonight? So props to the followers. You guys are really onto the show. Uh, we're, we're so flattered uh, for all of the likes and comments and questions and all the stuff you guys submit and the YouTube views and everything else. Uh, so many thanks to you and to all of our sponsors as well. Yes, and with that, uh, you can find me on Twitter. The handle's at Model3Owners. You can find me on the forum at teslaownersonline.com. My handle is Trev P. And, uh, you know, I want a big uh, thank you to our sponsors. That's the great guys at Fine Lab, uh, Dulaban Insurance, and the great guys at EvanX who make uh, fantastic Tesla products. Thank you for your continued support. And uh, if you are a listener, if you are out there and you like what we do and you want to support the show, you can check out our Patreon page and uh, maybe pledge a little something. That's uh, You can find that at uh, patreon.com forward slash model three owners club. That's it for tonight, and we'll catch you on the next show. And uh, thanks for tuning in and watching, listening, no matter where you happen to be. See you guys later. Bonsoir tout le monde.